Hello, church family. I I'm just reading in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, before I share what's on my heart with you, I thought maybe I'd share this little scripture with us tonight. From 1 Timothy chapter 3, here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle and not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not come to fall into disgrace, into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the, of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must be first, they must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, they may serve as a deacon. In the same way, the women among their number, or the deaconesses, or, or their wives, are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. On these Wednesday nights, I am just sharing with you uh, a few lessons that Sue and I learned, um, or that I learned along the way, that mean a lot to me. They're not really theologically, or the intent is not for them to be. Um, they're not really sermons. They're just uh, points that have been important to me, and I hope some of them will become important to you. And I hope some of my journey will be useful to you in your journey. So let me tell a little story about this one. Now, this goes back, uh, wow, long, long time ago, well over three decades ago. We were um, expecting our first child. And as we were expecting, I was a nervous young father-to-be, as you can expect. And I, I'm a researcher. I want to study everything carefully, and I, I want to know how to raise the child. So I, I got a bunch of books on how to raise children. I asked a lot of people how to raise children. I watched how to raise children. Most importantly to me was um, to know how strict to be. Should I be very strict with straight and narrow? Should I be fairly relaxed? Should I be an authoritarian? Should I be a friend? Should I um, spare the rod and spoil the child? Or should I lay on the rod and, and try, to, try to shake the will of the child? Well, I was asking myself all those questions. And as I studied it, I looked at a lot of people, a lot of people I respected, and a lot of people whose children turned out in a way that I respected. And so I looked at them and watched carefully how they did it. I didn't really ask them a lot. A lot of questions. I just watched them carefully. And to my surprise, I realized that um, I was asking myself the wrong question. Oh, there is a time and there is a place and there are theories on how you should discipline and, and what types of disciplines are good and what types of disciplines are unhealthy. And, and there are all sorts of um, theories on that. But what I realized was that for most of these families that I um, that I respected so much, it wasn't a matter of how they chose to raise their children. It was a matter of who they chose to be. Just like the scripture in 
First Timothy talks about those that are leaders in the church need to be above reproach. That is that I begin to realize that when all is said and done, as important as discipline is, that in the end, more is caught than taught. That is, your children, for better or for worse, are going to turn out a lot more like you than you intend them to. So for that reason, being is more important than doing. Now that's one of the little notes that I wrote down to myself, that being is more important than doing. That doesn't mean doing is not important, but it's secondary. Later on, as a pastor, I uh, asked myself the same kinds of questions on how do I lead my church? What do I do for church growth? How do I bring new people into the church? How do I, as a pastor, what do I need to study? What do I need to know? How do I need to frame my public relations and, and my publicity and all sorts of things in the church? And once again, I, I looked at older pastors and I realized that in the end, being is more important than doing. Not that doing's not important. Just that sometimes we wrap too much into that. Now, my church, whatever church I'm in, and your church has a leader. It probably has more than one leader, but, but you've got a leader or two that stand out above the others. They either have more respect or they have more authority or they are, uh, for some reason or the other, uh, listened to more than others. Your leader may very well be the pastor. But a lot of times it's not the pastor. I mean, we pastors, we come and go. We're at a place for a few years, then we're gone to another place. By the end of our lives, we have a string of friendships that date back through the years and through the churches. But someplace in that church, there may be somebody that doesn't come and go so much, and their word carries a lot of weight. You may be that person in whatever church you're in right now. If so, I need to tell you this, it's what I learned, that eventually, given enough time, the church will become a shadow, will mold itself, will become a copy of the leader of that church the same way that a, a parent becomes the, the leader of their children and their children model after them. That means, unfortunately, as a parent, my good traits and my bad traits I can see in my children. And in the church, if you're a leader in that church, long enough, you'll see some of your good traits and bad traits come out in the others around you. That's why doing is secondary to being. I was talking to someone earlier this week. We were just chatting about churches and church growth and, and the futures of church. And I reminded myself that I used to always say in my churches that the youth are the church of today and the older people are the church of tomorrow. You know, what's that mean? You know, we usually think of it as the young people are the, they're the church of tomorrow, but they're not. They have the energy. They have the excitement. They have the drive. They can carry on the work of the church. But when new people come to a church, they're going to pattern their lives after some older, respected person that helped bring them in, that meant a lot to them. And so while the young people uh, and the newer people give energy to the church, the older people give character and vision and help the younger people see what tomorrow can be. Now, I'm, at, I'm dumping a lot on you today. Are you a parent? Be a parent worth following. Are you a leader in the church? Be a leader worth following. Are you a Christian of influence? Are there people around you that watch what you do and hear what you say? Are there people that look at you and see in their mind what makes up a church? If so, make sure they're seeing a church worth going to. Heavy load. 
But being is more important than doing, and being real is more important than being fake and phony. I'm not saying put on a good front and a good face. I'm saying let the real you down deep be the type of person that's worth the next generation learning from. Well, I probably ought to breathe heavy on that one. Let me pray.